Sorry. Well, I will say Happy New Year to everybody as we uh, reconvene, and why don't we open in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, tonight. We thank you, Lord, for a uh, start of our second half of our study, and we look forward, Lord, to uh, continuing our study in Timothy. We ask this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, founded in 1985, Blockbuster Video saw growth until 2004. It peaked with more than 9,000 stores and employed approximately 58,000 people when, in the United States. And despite Blockbuster being a multi-billion dollar company, co-owner co Wayne Husinger worried about how new tech like video on demand and cable TV would affect business even in the early 1990s especially as the growth rate of the VCR ownership had gone down in the United States. In 1997, Warner Brothers offered Blockbuster an exclusive early access rental deal, wherein Blockbuster could release DVD rentals before they went on sale to the public. But Blockbuster turned them down. Instead, Walmart seized the deal and other mass retailers began selling DVDs below wholesale price and Blockbuster couldn't match such prices, severely impacting its business model. In 2000, Netflix co-founder Reed Hastings offered to sell Netflix to Blockbuster for $50 million, but the Blockbuster declined because the CEO, John Antioco, thought it was a small niche business that would never take off. A former Blockbuster executive was quoted as saying, Management and vision are two separate things. We had the option to buy Netflix for 50 million and we didn't do it. They were losing money. They came around a few times. An inadequate leadership team caused Blockbuster to miss numerous business opportunities that would have strengthened their financial position and protected the stock price. We had lousy management. Between poor leadership the recession and competition from wholesale retailers and new technology, Blockbuster saw significant losses in revenue throughout the late 2000s. It filed for bankruptcy protection in 2010. Now, although the example I just read to you is in the public arena, it has many parallels to the church at Ephesus to whom Paul wrote his epistle of 1 Timothy. Paul saw the church assembling a poor and spiritually unqualified leadership team. And he knew if this trend continued that the church would fall, fail miserably in its mission to reach the unsaved people of Ephesus. Bankruptcy, if you will, once of a once prominent and thriving church. And that's exactly what this chapter is about tonight. Our scripture passage is 1 Timothy chapter three, and I've entitled it, how one ought to behave in church, and have broken it down into three sections. The first is 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, qualifications for elders. Secondly, 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, qualifications for deacons and deaconesses. And finally, 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16, the church of the living God. Well, how about a quick review, since we've been off for three weeks. Let's bring everybody back up to the same page. Paul is writing to Timothy, who has been let, been let in the city of Ephesus to pastor this church that Paul had founded 12 years earlier and had pastored for three years, a church God used to found all the other churches in Asia Minor. The godly men Paul had raised up to lead the church are gone, and in their place, false teachers had not only infiltrated the church, but had been elevated to leadership positions. And after a visit to Ephesus, where Hymenaeus and Alexander are expelled, a visit, uh, Paul then basically goes on to Macedonia, but he quickly writes a letter back to Timothy, commanding him to clean up the issues that are within the church. And Paul gives very specific instructions about the qualifications that are required for leadership positions within the church. To raise the standard of leadership, to the level that the word of God required. Paul says basically, whomever leads in this church, that is what the church will become. And here, leaders were teaching lies, they were teaching false doctrine, false religious systems, and living ungodly lives. Hardly the church that Paul had founded. 
And you can imagine the consternation Paul had as he heard all of these things that were going on at church that he loved so much. So Paul outlines for Timothy the qualifications for elders and for deacons and deaconesses that demonstrate virtue and spiritual character that reflect godliness. He says, if anyone aspires to this role, in other words, if they're called, it's a spiritual thing. It's not something that just says, hey, you know what, maybe I'll try being an elder. It's got to be a calling. The Holy Spirit's involved in this. It's a call of compulsion to be a man of God, someone who desires to lead in the church and per pursues it on the outside because he's driven on the inside because of this calling. An elder or the description of an elder is one given authority by Christ to rule on his behalf using his word, to lead, to preach, to teach, and to pray for those entrusted to them. However, they must be spiritually qualified as well as being compelled to pursue the office of elder. In other words, it's a two-part thing. They've got to be called, but they also have to be qualified. And it's one thing to seek the office of an elder, and it's quite another to be qualified to receive it. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy as he begins chapter three. He gives them a number of qualifications, but overarching is it says they must be blameless, not sinless, because no one is, but above reproach. But in the present, he is blameless. In other words, Paul is saying, we don't want to put people in that have something that would disqualify them from leading other people. From a spiritual sense, they have to have certain qualifications. It's nothing that anybody could accuse him of in the present life. He's not saying at one point when they weren't saved and they did things that people you know, could hold that against them. But once they were saved, he's saying they need to be built blameless. And he breaks it down into four areas that he wants to look at. And he, and he gives very specifics. He said, I'm an example, follow me, right? The same character is then required of the congregation. So what Paul is telling Timothy is he says, it's so important that you have leadership. And as we go through this, I want you to think about the structure that Paul is outlining and thinking how that if he gets men in positions of elders that have these qualifications, and he gets men and women that have the qualifications for the deacon role, how that church then to become a real evangelistic tool in this pagan city of Ephesus. But without that leadership, without that foundation, they have no chance of accomplishing the very things that Jesus said he wanted done from his church. So he says, again, they have to be blameless. The elder is to set the model for the people in which to pattern their life. So verses two through seven describe four areas that we're going to look at. And the first is moral character. He basically says they've got to be a husband of one wife. Now, what he's talking about here is it stresses <laughs> his character, not his marital status, uh, excuse me, status. It's meaning that a man has to be devoted to the one woman in his heart and his mind. There was sexual evil that was rampant in Ephesus. We've talked about this. this. The worship of Diana, the temple prostitutes that were there, that was very much a daily practice in the pagan world. And he's saying that woman that is his wife that God gave to him, sexual purity in thought and conduct is what Paul is telling Timothy must be one of the characteristics of an elder. He then goes on and tells him that he's got to be temperate. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, the, the actual meaning says he can't overindulge in wine, which dulls his senses, right? Again, think about the environment they're in. Drunken orgies were part of the Ephesian culture, and the elder was to be alert and watchful and clear-headed, no excesses, always in clear use of his faculties, could refer to anything in excess. So it could be drugs, it could be food, it could be anything that basically showed a lack of self-control. The third thing he says is sober-minded. So if temperate is to be kind of, to be aware and to stay away from things that might make him not clear-headed, the sober-mindedness is basically a fulfillment of that. It's showing that the, the man that's picked to be an elder would be well-disciplined, know how to order his priorities, serious about spiritual matters, pervasive sense of the seriousness of church leadership and its responsibilities. He makes judgments with great caution doesn't waste time on foolish things. That's what he's talking about here. 
he talks about good behavior. And, and here he stresses, if he thinks with a sober mind, then his system of living is going to be orderly. The guy is not chaotic. The guy has priorities. He knows, he thinks on the right things. He knows how to establish his priorities and it shows in the order of his life. So you get the composite picture of someone who's pretty organized in his thinking. But the discipline of his heart and his mind are seen in the discipline of his actions. That's what Paul's getting to here. He says he's got to be hospitable. Well, that's interesting. But it's the word means loving someone who isn't your friend. His life and his home are open so that the true character of his life is manifest to all who come in there, right? I, I think back to this past week when we read about the tremendous storm that was in Buffalo. And there was a Korean family that was stranded in their uh, vehicle. And they went up on a door and knocked on the door and said, can we borrow a shovel? And the woman, I don't know if she's a Christian or not, invited the entire family in to have Christmas dinner with them because they couldn't go anywhere because of the snow. That's the type of hospitality that Paul's talking about should permeate the personality of an elder. He says skilled in teaching. And I think this is one of the most important parts. There's a marked skill in teaching that goes along with his unique moral spiritual qualifications. The only thing that really sets an elder apart from a deacon is the skill of teaching. And the only attribute that is not a moral qualification in the list that Paul gives to Timothy. But if you think about it, if you're teaching something that is of a moral value and of a spiritual nature and your life doesn't manifest that, it kind of contradicts. He's talking here about being able to tell the gospel in a clear, concise manner so that people will be attracted to it. He said, if you're a good teacher, people will remember the divine truth. Look at the apostles, right? Look at the example that was given to them by Jesus that they then in turn gave to each of these churches. He basically is saying you're to be a prototype of what you're teaching to people. Again, it comes back to the alcohol, not a drunkard. Notice he doesn't say he forbids them from drinking at all. Wine was used extensively in the, that period of time both for, for you know, kind of drink for nourishment, but also for medicine. So he's saying, you can't, I'm not telling you not to drink, but you can't be a drunkard, right? He can't drink until he's drunk, but he, has, he doesn't have a reputation as a drinker as well. You can be someone who only has one or two drinks a night, but you're in saloons or you're in pubs or you're in these bars. And he's saying, that's not the type of lifestyle we want. We don't want someone who's hanging around those kind of places. Right? They're not, that's not the kind of people we want to choose to lead this congregation. I find this next one interesting. Not violent, but gentle. That seems to go without saying that an elder would settle an argument by punching the guy next to him. But that's what he's talking about. He's not quick-tempered. He doesn't deal with difficulties through violent physical reactions. And it's someone who can deal with things with a cool mind, with gentleness, not with a hostile attitude. And he's talking about physically as well as verbally. You can have some, pretty, some people that are pretty violent with their words. And he's saying, that's not the type of individual I'm looking for to lead this church. He also says not quarrelsome. Well, that kind of makes sense. Considerate, forbearing, gracious and gentle, easily pardons human failure, patient, focusing on the good done by others rather than the injury and retaliation, doesn't hold grudges, peacemaking. Do you start to see kind of the composite personality that Paul is saying, these are the men we want? He adds one more, not a lover of money, because often the pursuit of money corrupts the individual. Think of the televangelists that got so enmeshed with their business of, of raising money that they fell off to the side because the love of money transcended what they were trying to tell the people. So really the summary that Paul is saying, if you wanna be an elder, Timothy, this is what I want <coughs> you to find. Someone who has the moral character of a man who leads the church. He's not greedy. He's not stingy. He's not indulgent. If he is not ambitious, right? He has all of the qualifications that would mirror kind of what Christ modeled for us. And he's saying, that's what you want to have from a moral standpoint. But then he transitions immediately into the home life of the individual. And he's saying, if you desire a place of spiritual leadership, you must have demonstrated the capability of such leadership in the home before you would be counted worthy to demonstrate it in the church. Well, what does that tell us? 
It's saying that he's got to be able to manage his own home to preside or have authority over is what the word means. He's to be a strong spiritual leader in his home. His leadership is inherently good and it's manifest, manifestly good to all those who perceive and see his leadership there. So what he's saying is, Timothy, don't just look at what he's like in the church, see what he's like at home as well. Does he manage his household well? Now notice it says household. He's not just talking about his children. It also includes the affairs of his living. What kind of steward is he of money, of his resources, of his finances? I mean, you wouldn't want an elder that had just declared bankruptcy because they have a responsibility to oversee the finances of the church. He must manage the people and the resources in his home of which he has responsibility. So that's what they're talking about. The children should be respectful. They should be controlled. They should be disciplined. And they should show respect for the parents and have a belief in the gospel. So again, do you see the meat starting to be put on this skeleton that, that Paul has outlined for Timothy? These are things that are a must if you want to lead in the church of Ephesus. He transitions then and talks about the maturity. The elder candidate shouldn't be a new convert. Well, boy, that's kind of interesting. Why not? You would think there'd be a lot of energy and excitement. But he says, no, there could be a tendency to become prideful. He used the word puffed up. Why? Well, think about it. If you put a young convert in with a number of older, more mature Christians, he might believe he's better than he is. He might get puffed up, as it says. The tendency is going to be to hit, for him to feel proud about having been elevated to that level of leadership occupied by older, more mature, godly men who've been in the church for many years. So he's saying, don't go there, Timothy. They should be older in their spiritual age. They can fall into the condemnation of the devil, is the phrase that he uses. And if he falls into the judgment God pronounced on the devil, well, think about it. What happened to Satan? Satan became prideful and thought he was equal or better than God. And God cast him out of heaven. And that was a sin of pride that cost Satan his, his uh, residency in heaven. He's prideful. He's going to be cast down, just like Satan was when he was thrown out of heaven. And then the fourth category he talks about is tested as to reputation. Well, that's interesting. He must be well thought of, not only good inwardly, but good outwardly as well. He has character, a good reputation. And this reputation isn't just in the church. It's certified by those in his community that are not part of his church. Well, think about that. People know him and know that he's a man of moral character. If the community didn't have any respect for this individual, how could they ever impact from a spiritual sense this community for Christ? Because there is nothing the devil would want more than to set a trap to discredit the man in spiritual service. He wants spiritual leaders to fall easy prey into some skillfully laid snare. His aim is to destroy the credibility and integrity of the leaders of the church and to trap them. Now, as we leave this section and move into the second section, I want you to kind of focus on the environment or the context in which Paul is writing this letter. They are in a very pagan city of Ephesus. In, in nine short years, we've seen the church disintegrate into false teaching. We've seen kind of uh, evil men and women move into positions of leadership, and that becomes the identification of the church. And if you think about it, how could they ever accomplish what Paul set out to do? How could they ever accomplish of winning converts to Christ if they didn't have this kind of setup? And more importantly, the elders were the ones to model for the rest of the congregation what spiritual living was all about. And if they couldn't do that, then what would you expect the congregation would do? They would follow the leader's characteristics, they would follow the leader's behavior, and they certainly would never be an influence into that world. So you can see why Paul is so insistent that Timothy understands this. And he doesn't say, Timothy, if you have some time, you might want to consider. It's a command. He's saying, Timothy, you must get rid of these people that are in positions of leadership now, just like I got rid of the guys in chapter one. And he said, and you've got to replace them with guys that have a moral and a spiritual kind of characteristic that is just outlined in the first seven verses. He then transitions and he talks about deacons. 
And again, he doesn't say here that deacons are less <coughs> spiritual than elders. He doesn't say, well, if you really work hard at being a deacon, someday you can be promoted to an elder. He does not distinguish. And as you look at the list, he turns to this group of leaders within the church, and Paul basically says the qualifications of both groups are basically the same, right? There is no difference between the spiritual qualifications of an elder and a deacon. The elders have authority because they carry the power of the word of God in their teaching emphasis. That's the only distinguishing factor that you have is the elders are teaching and, and the, and the uh, deacons are coming along serving uh, what the elders have laid out. They come right alongside the elders and implement what is taught by the elders. The message of what a deacon is to be is the message of what you and I are to be because they're there to model that for us. That's what Paul is saying. And again, I want you to think of the church. If you suddenly plant 12 elders with the characteristics we just described, and right next to them, you have elders that are godly men and, and women that are serving the elders and what they the put out for the vision of the church. Suddenly, the whole congregation sees this model for them. And that's what they're supposed to be following. He's saying their personal life, their character, their home life, the leadership capability and commitment to service of the Lord and the church are exactly the same for both. There's no lessening of the spiritual standard or the bar. It's not lowered for a deacon. The deacon is basically there to serve or to be of service. It's a group of chosen and select people called to be the leaders of the serving of the church. Model the proper kind of service for everybody else in the church. And what is the goal of the church? Well, it's to win, it's to teach, it's to train and to send. And when you think about it, as the elders laid out the strategy or the vision for the church, it takes a lot. Think about in your own churches. We want to have an outreach to the poor people in our community. Well, there's a lot of administrative things that go into that. We want to reach out to the widows and the orphans and the poor people. There's a lot of administrative stuff that goes into that. We want to have a ministry for, for widows. There's a lot of administrative work that goes into that. So the elders are working hand in glove with the deacons to execute the vision for that particular church. And what are their qualifications? Well, they've got to be dignified and serious. They've got to be, be serious in mind and in character. The people will notice them because of the integrity of their spiritual life. They understand what it is to be a Christian and to be serious about righteousness in their lives. It says they're not double-tongued. Well, what does that mean? They don't gossip, right? They don't say one thing to one person and another thing to someone else. It's an integrity of their speech. He says they're not addicted to alcohol, same as for an elder, right? Doesn't allow alcohol to influence his life. Not greedy for dishonest gain and handling money. If you think about the old church, every week they would collect money from the congregation that would then be given to the poor and needy within the church. If you've got someone who's a lover of money, they might be tempted to go ahead and steal that. So he makes that a qualification. It says they've got to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Well, that's an interesting phrase. What he's saying is basically New Testament revelation, right? A mystery was to the Old Testament. They didn't understand all of the things that were prophesied that were going to take place. And it wasn't until Jesus came that that mystery really was unveiled. And that's what he's saying. They have to understand all of that means, that mystery, that means Christ coming to earth in, as in a human form. It means Christ being sinless. It means Christ dying for us. It means Christ being resurrected. It means Christ ascending into heaven. It means Christ laying out for us what it means to be a follower of him. That's the mystery. They need to understand it. And it says with a clear conscience. So it doesn't only mean they have to understand it. It means they have to live it. Do you see, again, the model, the bar that is raised here to be a deacon? Even though your chore or your task is to serve, you still have to have these spiritual qualifications, right? And so that's what he's talking about here. The clear conscience is because he is holding the truth and obeying the truth. So his con conscience isn't pricking him saying, hey, you're saying you live your life this way, but here's what you're really doing. Clear conscience means he is right before the Lord. And it says, let them be tested. This is interesting. Put them on a probationary period where their lives are being evaluated or assessed by the church as their Christian service. 
basically, let's give them a, a trial. Let's see how they do. We want them here. We think they have the qualifications, but let's put them on a period of time to see what their service looks like. It says they're to be blameless, just like the elders, right? No blot on their life without reproach, nothing in their lives that would disqualify. And then again, it says a home life. They're to be a one woman man, committed to the one woman and managing their children and households well. Do you see the parallels that Paul outlines? Very consistent of what he's looking for. And I kept thinking, boy, if Timothy had the guts, this is a 35-year-old guy. If he has the guts with the power of the Holy Spirit to go in and confront some of these older false teachers that were there and throw them out by the authority that Paul has given to him, and then to find these godly men, imagine the power that this church at Ephesus would become. And that's the vision that Paul is giving to Timothy. The main job of the deacon is to carry out the application of the teaching being done by the pastors and the elders. That's the job description. Those are the qualifications that we just covered that are very much like the elders. But then he transitions and he says, likewise. And we had some discussion on this in our group as well. In some translations, it says, and the wives of deacons must be. And, and again, every commentator or every commentary that I read basically said, you substitute the word woman. And when he says likewise, he's transitioning. He's transitioned from elders to deacons. Now he's transitioning to deaconesses. And this does not contradict at all what he says in chapter two about women's role in the church. This is a service oriented job. It's not teaching. It's not usurping the responsibility of men. It's coming alongside and serving. And all throughout the New Testament, you can see women that came alongside Christ and his disciples and were servants to them and, and managed the needs that they had. Their qualifications also parallel the deacons. They're supposed to be dignified, serious, respected, held in high esteem because of their spiritual devotion. They're not supposed to be slanderers. They control their tongue. They don't gossip. They're sober-minded as well. They're to be sober in their judgment, and not influenced by too much wine. You see the pattern here? Doesn't prohibit drinking, but it basically says you can't be drunk. You can't rely on alcohol. It says faithful in all things and absolutely trustworthy. Do you see the profile? Again, you see very consistent to the deacons, very consistent to the elders. And as these examples spread throughout the church and became influential in mentoring other congregants, that church would become a powerful source. And he finally says, and to those deacons and deaconesses that have served well. So he basically says, here's what, what's going to happen, right? If you get these right people in the place, here's what's going to take place. You're going to be put on a pedestal. You're going to have served in humility, and you're going to be lifted up. You're going to be lifted up and respected by people, but you're also going to be respected by God, who will say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to, you're going to gain a good standing before both people and before God. And then he also says something interesting. He says, and you're going to, you're going to gain great confidence in the faith of Christ. Well, what does he mean by that? He says, because you're serving well and God is blessing your service, you're going to see how Christ is working in the church. And you're going to be energized by seeing God use you for his service in the church it will motivate you to higher levels of service. And, you know, I had an interesting conversation this past week. I was in upstate New York, and I was talking to somebody about CBS, and they said, well, what do you teach? And I told them about it, and I told them, you know, kind of some of the things we were talking about. And he said, boy, you know, there's a perfect example of a woman like that in our church. He said, we had a, an outgoing service that basically said, we want to take care of the elderly, and we want to take care of the widows. And there was one woman in the church that basically delivered a Thanksgiving bag to an elderly lady, an elderly lady and her, her nurse that was there. And the lady was so thankful and all she wanted to do was talk. And so the lady said, well, you know, I've got to deliver these other bags. I'll come back next week. And she came back next week. And the, the guy's telling me this because this woman would come back to the church all excited about the progress that was being made with this lady who was a, a self-professed atheist. And the more she kept talking to her, and the more she befriended her, over the course of a year, she led this lady to Christ, and she led the nurse to Christ. And she was so excited about seeing God work in her life as a servant, 
that would yield those kind of results that she came back and now is leading these types of service things to the community because she's seen it work. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, you're going to be so energized by seeing the Holy Spirit work in a godly congregation that you're going to want more. You're going to be so excited about what's taking place. Well, the final thing we talk about is the church of the living God. That's what he says in the last couple of verses. And I would argue these are probably the most important verses of this entire epistle. There's a reason that I wrote this epistle is basically what Paul is saying. If I can't get there, in other words, I'm trying to get back and help you with this, Timothy, but if I don't, here are the things that you have to know. Here is how you're going to act in the church. And he finishes up with this thought. He says, you're an assembly, which is the living God's church. Now, again, I want you to contrast that to the environment that Paul is writing to Timothy. Contrast that to the idol worship in the temple of Diana or Artemis, right? They're the assembly of a dead idol. But he said, you, Timothy, are the assembly of the living God. Paul saying to Timothy, you represent the living God. So therefore, you have to conduct yourself in a way that is consistent with the one whose image you bear. Now, if you think about it, the heart of the church's mission is basically the pillar, right? The foundation of the truth. That's what Paul is saying. You have the real truth. Now, he's comparing it to the Temple of Diana, which is a tremendous wonder in the ancient world and is still standing today. It had 127 pillars that supported the roof. It had solid marble pillars studded with jewels and overlaid with gold. And what you would have is you would have rulers from the surrounding areas that would send a pillar and wanted it dedicated to Diana in their name. That's how ornate it was. But what Paul is saying, it's the foundation of pillars that held up the temple that supports death, that supports emptiness, that supports a false way of thinking. Diana's testimony is to error and lies and paganism and a false religion. But you, Timothy, are in a church, the assembly of God, that basically is supporting the truth. The church is in existence to hold up the truth of God. The church doesn't make the truth. You just hold it up and support it. And the truth is what? It's the gospel. It's the revelation of salvation. It's God's saving truth. That's the heart of the mission of the church. How? Well, because you hear it, you memorize it, you meditate on it, you study it, you obey it, you defend it, you live it, and then you proclaim it. That's what he's telling them. But you can't do that if you don't have the right leadership in place. And if that leadership doesn't have the godly characteristics that I'm writing to you about, there's no chance that you're going to be able to support the truth of God's word. He wants him to shine as a light in the darkness. In this pagan city of Ephesus, he's saying, if you do these things, you will stand out. And no matter what the ministry is within the church or the gift, the foundation is upholding God's truth. That's what he's saying. But then he goes on and he's saying, and the heart of that message, that great mystery of godliness is Christ. He's the heart and soul of the message of truth. It's the fundamental belief of Christianity. I always laughed when I watched you know, the old tape of Vince Lombardi, who was the coach of the Green Bay Packers, that were one of the best football teams of the 60s. And when his team wouldn't play well, he would hold up the football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. And what he was saying is you played so poorly that you've forgotten the fundamentals that I've taught you. And that's what Paul is saying here. This is, there's a unanimous consent on this point. Christ is the center of the truth that you uphold in this church. Think about what Paul is speaking about. Go back and read Acts 19. It's before the church of Ephesus was formed. And Paul is there and he confronts these people. Remember the silversmiths that were making the idols? And suddenly Paul's talking about this new truth in Christ. And what they were doing is they would form kind of this mob, basically, and they would chant, great is Diana, Artemis of the Ephesians. For two hours, it tells us in that chapter, that they kept saying, great is the mystery of Diana. Great is Diana. And what Paul is doing is contrasting that. And he's saying, you have great is the mystery of godliness. And it's centered around Jesus Christ. 
And this mystery has now been re revealed to you, Timothy. It's godliness, it's piety, right? It's holiness, it's devotion. And great is the sacred secret of our saving faith in Christ. And your faith should produce godliness built on the godliness of Jesus, right? He's the source of true godliness. He's the one now revealed in the New Testament. So that's the one they're talking about. And they conclude now with the song that basically identifies all of the characteristics of Christ. It basically tells the gospel story. He who was manifest in the flesh, right? It tells you God became man in human form. Christ pre-existed, but he came to earth. He wasn't visible, but now he is. And now we understand that mystery. He was vindicated by the spirit to be declared righteous, right? The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead because he was sinless and righteous and holy right? That's what he's talking about. And he says, as seen by angels. And as we talked in our group, he saw the holy angel song, but so did the unholy angels that were in the pit. You remember on the resurrection, he descended into hell and basically blew up their victory party of him being crucified, <laughs> right? And it tells us the holy angels are in awe of him and they worship him. We studied that in Revelation. The fallen angels are in awe of him as well. They just despise him but all the angels were made subject to him. That's what it says. And he said, he'll be proclaimed amongst the nations. Can you see Paul's kind of consternation here saying, I planted a church that was going to proclaim to the nations, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth. And it's screwed up now. And Timothy, I implore you, fix it. You got to fix it, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we can't do that till we get the fundamentals right here in our church. And it said it believed on in the world. And Paul knows, he knows from self-experience, if you do this, if you live the right way, the preaching will result in faith and it'll result in salvation for those that you're talking to. And he finally says he ascended into heaven. He was done. He had completed his task. And now the task falls to the church to be the conduit to the unbelievers. And you can see Paul so upset, knowing that he had started this, this church out on the right foundation and it had fallen away. And so that's the message that he's giving here in chapter three. That's the message that he, he wants us to understand. Now, we look at this and say, all right, what do I do with this? What's the conclusion I have on this, right? The leaders of the church, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses are to be of such character that their congregations will want to model their behavior, which leads to a vibrant church. That seems pretty basic. Listen to this story and see if you see the comparison. There's a community that's high up in the mountains of Colorado. It's a tourist attraction because from the highest vantage point, they can see some of the most beautiful scenery in Colorado, the mountains, the valleys, the rivers. It's got such a, a beautiful vantage point. And one section in particular is on a sheer precipice, which basically drops hundreds of feet below to a beautiful valley. And of course, people being like they are, want to get right to the edge so they can get the best view. And many people would try to get so close to the edge that they could see all of it. But the problem is many of them have fallen over. Some break bones as they hit the slant of the valley going down, but others have actually lost their lives. So the committee of the town got together and basically said, why don't we purchase several ambulances to park at the bottom of the valley to get the injured to the hospital quicker? Well, the problem was that was a very expensive thing to have ambulances there 24 seven and staffed by EMTs. So the committee reconvened and they basically said, maybe we could put a fence at the top of the mountain. Guess what? From then on, there were no more injuries or deaths that occurred. Now, you say to yourself, what does that have to do with anything in chapter three? <coughs> well, let me bring it into focus. The point is, that is kind of a portrait of today's church. What do I mean by that? The church is very good at setting up ambulance programs, but not so good at putting up fences. What do you mean? Well, the ambulance program basically helps to repair broken lives after they've fallen, whether it's for grief, whether it's for addiction, whether it's for money management, whether it's for depression, it doesn't matter. It's after the fact, right? But instead, the church needs to put a fence at the top of the precipice to shield people from the initial danger. 
something such as leadership that have such Christ-like exemplary lives with such character and spiritual integrity that they would become the fence that would shield the people from falling into the danger of a wayward life. Just as the fence influences the people from coming near danger, so godly church leadership influences the people from coming near spiritual danger. And that's what Paul is trying to implant in Timothy's mind, is to build a church that is so godly and so righteous and has a leadership that is so committed to following Christ that the rest of the congregation would do the same. And they would be protected and they would be invested in and they would be mentored. And from that would come an explosion of evangelical attitudes and, and reaching out to this, this pagan city of Ephesus that would bring them also into the church. And if that continued to multiply, you could see the effect that Paul envisioned for this church. So as we read this and we look at this, it tells us to look at our own character because we have the same responsibility as an elder or as a deacon to live our lives according to what Jesus said we should be doing. And when we look at being able to do that amongst an assembly of people that are all kind of doing the same thing, watch the power of that church. And that's the message that Paul wants to leave us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you, Lord, for an outline, a template of what it is to be a godly leader and what it is to, to live according to what Christ wants. And Lord, I don't understand how anybody can read this and not say, okay, I understand what my life needs to be like. And Lord, we know that without the Holy Spirit, it's, it's impossible. And we, we feel for Timothy as he's now left to kind of implement this plan. But Lord, we pray for godly churches with godly leaders that would impact the society and their environment that they're within. We ask this in your name. Amen.